For Craig Heaney of the Stone Bard Center for Food and Agriculture, the annual ritual of tapping maple trees to produce syrup gets kind of sappy. I was about, I guess I was 18 years old when I started, and uh, part of the charm for me was collecting 1,200 buckets on snowshoes. I find it really magical because it's just such a great time of year. With the end of winter, as temperatures begin to rise above freezing, there's an eager anticipation for the first harvest of the year. If you've gone through a long winter, it's just like, all right, there's hope, you know, it's like, it's gonna taste pretty damn sweet at the end, you know. Maple tappers wait for the conditions to be just right in order for the tree's sap to begin flowing. Say you get a freezing night, it creates negative pressure in the tree. And the roots will actually bring in more water at that point. The following day, if the temperature rises above freezing, the carbon dioxide in there will start to expand. It becomes positive pressure. It goes from sort of drawing up some water to then releasing it. And if you've put a, a small hole, pressure will be relieved, sap will flow out the tap hole. And hopefully fill a conveniently placed bucket. Repeat this process throughout your sugar bush, which is neither sugar nor a bush, discuss among yourselves, and you should have gallons of sap. It's mostly water, it's about 98% water, but it's got some sucrose in it. And this would make for some really soggy, bland waffles. To get syrup, you'll need a little bit of basic chemistry. Dr. Abby Vandenberg of the University of Vermont's Proctor Maple Research Center explains. Simply need to concentrate that sap from 2% sugar, which is how it comes out of the tree, up to syrup density, which is about 67 or 66% sugar. And the traditional way to accomplish that is through heat-driven evaporation. The sap is run through a series of pans, which not only boil off the water, but provide the syrup's trademark flavor. Most of the flavor that develops in maple syrup develops as that sap is processed into syrup using heat in the evaporator. Things develop like sugar degradation products and mired reaction products. Which also provides the syrup with its varying hues of amber and caramel. The final product is filtered, bottled, and sold with old-timey depictions of horses and sleighs and log cabins to give you that syrupy sense of nostalgia. But there's just one sticking point with this pastoral image. Commercial maple syrup producer would be uh, putting taps up with uh, tubing. Basically, it looks like little tributaries, and uh, they'd either be gravity-fed to a collection barrel, or the, if it was in a flat area, they would actually use a vacuum system. A vast number of the maple operations are using tubing and vacuum sap collection, and things that also might not quite fit with that sort of uh, bucolic rural image. And if plastic and pumps shatter your expectations, then you'll probably think the research of Dr. Vandenberg and her colleague Dr. Perkins is syrup sacrilege. In their experiments, they draw sap from juvenile trees. And collecting it by excising or cutting off the top portion of the tree and collecting it directly from the surface of the cut stem. It sounds extreme, lopping off the top of a sapling and sucking out its juices through a vacuum tube. But this method is not as harmful as it looks. The tree does not die. The tree actually will re-sprout, and actually quite vigorously so. It'll re-sprout from dormant buds in the stem the following growing seasons. You can use these trees year after year. Um, in a single-stemmed individual, you make cuts progressively further down the stem. Um, in a multiple stem tree, you can move from stem to stem to stem. Where you actually draw sap from the intact side of the tree. The yields from these small trees are very, very low compared to a traditional 12-inch uh, tree. The difference comes in when you look at it sort of on a land use area basis. Using this method, they estimate you can get five to six times more sap than the traditional tapping of older and larger trees. This method certainly isn't designed to supplant or replace the existing system of maple syrup production. We envision this as a way for producers to use potentially open land that they already had near their operations, an acre or two or three. They could then use this technique to help increase production of their operations without having to invest a large amount of capital into forested land. But if you're a purist, you have some time to get used to this idea. For one, this is a really early stage in research and we wouldn't expect it to be commercially available um, in the very near future. And even then you'd have to wait seven to 10 years before your saplings were big enough to harvest. In the meantime, if you want to keep that warm, fuzzy feeling going, remember that maple syrup is supposed to be sappy not corny. A huge faux pas would be using a table syrup that you buy um, that's made predominantly with high fructose corn syrup and some flavoring. 
You know, even in a dire strait, I would rather just have a pancake at a diner with some butter. Think this technique will revolutionize how we produce maple syrup? Head over to sciencefriday.com and tell us what you think. For Science Friday, I'm Luke Groskin.